Today, we're looking at this idea of joining God in the renewal of all things. What has church got to do with the rest of our lives? We know about Sunday. Hang on, this is bugging me now. There we go. We know about Sunday, but what about Monday morning? What does an encounter with God in church today, this morning, change the way that you teach or diagnose a patient or play an instrument or, or make money or design a logo or invent something new? How does it change the way you organize others or perform in front of an audience or advocate on behalf of the vulnerable? These things matter to me, so we're going to look at them this morning. Dorothy Sayers, the crime writer and Christian essayist, said this, how can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of his life? So today we're going to be looking at this idea of joining God. This is our calling, our vocation as the people of God, both as the church and as Christian individuals. We are called to join God in the renewal of all things, and we're going to look at three ideas. The basis of that is to know the whole story, not just the half story. The second is to be a culture shaper, not just a culture survivor. And the third is to give your whole life, not just your spiritual life. So let's start with this first idea that we need to know the whole story, not just the half story. And this is the main bit of what I want to say this morning, and uh, taken right out of Colossians, so uh, keep that open if you will. I don't know about you, but when I became a Christian, I heard a particular story, uh, and it was called the gospel. And uh, it had two parts to it, really. It had the bad news and the good news. The bad news, which is where we began, said, I'm a sinner, and, uh, and therefore I'm under the judgment of God. I'm facing his wrath and an eternity in hell. But there was good news to correspond with that bad news, and that was that Jesus had died for me, that because of him, if I put my faith in him, I could be forgiven and receive eternal life and spend eternity in heaven. Who's heard that story before? Who believes that story? Okay. Now, that is only half the story. Okay? That's all you've got at that point. It's like going into a cinema. Yesterday I went in uh, to watch Shaun the Sheep, the movie, with Amelia and, uh, and Orla, which was quite entertaining for me, and I think perhaps slightly less so for the rest of the cinema. But it's like going into a movie and arriving 20 minutes late and leaving 20 minutes early. You miss the beginning and the end. How can you know the whole story if that's all you've heard? Because the Christian story, the whole story, starts not with sin, not with our need for God, but with his creation of us. The whole story starts with creation. It starts with good news, not bad news. And you can see that in our reading, can't you? There are these repeated references to Genesis 1 and 2. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. All things, all creation was created in him, through him, and for him. Now, do you know what all things means? Shall I tell you? It means all things. All things, absolutely everything. Look how he unpacks it. He says, all things in heaven and on earth, all things visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities. Now, what he's doing there is including the natural world that we think of when we think of God's creation, the structure of the atom, the movement of the solar system, the planets, the life cycle of plants, you know, that sort of thing. But he's also thinking about the social world. Culture, society, civilization. God, he's saying, made the world and it was good. He made the physical material world, the world of dirt and stone and flesh and blood, the world of sweat and metal and brick and wood, and it was all good. It was all spiritual. And then God created us. 
in his image. Now, what do you think that means, to be made in the image of God? Sometimes theologians have thought it means our rationality, our ability to think and to reason. Others, they've thought that it's, it's about our spirituality, the fact that we can have a relationship with God. I think those things offer part of an answer, but at best only a part. The truth is, it's all about our creativity. The image of God is a vocation. It's a job that we have been given. In the ancient Near East, when that story of Genesis was written, a a viceroy, a representative, an ambassador, bore the image of the absent king, the king in the distant land. And that's the picture that the writer of Genesis is painting. We are God's viceroys. We, are, we bear his image. We do what he did. We create. And so Andy Crouch, in his fantastic book, Culture Making, says, surely the primary implication of that is that they will reflect the creative character of their maker. That means human beings are designed to make culture. Human beings carry on where God left off. We finish and we furnish an empty world. If you turn back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, you see what's called the cultural mandate. That's where uh, God says to hum- the human beings, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air. Be fruitful, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. You can see that uh, repeated in uh, the second chapter of Genesis, chapter 15, where Adam is given a commission to work and take care of the Garden of Eden. That he is to cultivate the garden. You see, human beings, each one of us, you and me, we are to make something out of this world. We are to do something with the raw materials that God has given us. We are to cultivate culture. You see, creation isn't a static thing. Once made, it never changes. It continues to unfold, and we play our part in that process as the creative cultivators of God's creation. Isn't that exciting? I'm excited about that. Now, the fall, then... When we bring that into play in this story, impacts the whole of creation, not just the human soul. You see, you notice though, it's only after creation that the fall takes place. And so sin distorts creation, it distorts humanity's creative freedom, and culture gets entwined with sin. And so the way we understand sin here really matters. Sin distorts and warps and kind of caricatures God's good creation. And what that means is the structures of creation that are good remain. You might call them the different spheres of life that have been designed by God, like family and church and government and business, uh, entertainment, the media, education, those sorts of spheres that we're all familiar with. But the direction of those spheres, their direction of travel has been distorted and warped and knocked out of kilter. And so we end up uh, in this story uh, of prehistory in Genesis 1 to 12 with the, the, ex- the example of what happens when culture is distorted, we end up with Babel, a vanity project, a declaration of independence from God. So you could say effectively that the fall is decreation. Sin reintroduces chaos back into the order of God's good creation. So the fall is a cosmic catastrophe. Are you with me? Yeah, guys at the back? Are you with me? Brilliant. What that means, of course, is that salvation is cosmic too. So look at our reading, verse 20. For God was pleased to reconcile to himself what? What did he reconcile to himself? Human souls? All things. Hey, that's all, all things. 
whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That means that redemption is the restoration of the whole of created life. It's the renovation of the cosmos. And if sin is decreation, what it means is, is that salvation is recreation. Grace restores nature. That's what we talk about when we talk about the kingdom of God. And Jesus has inaugurated the kingdom of God. This beachhead has been established in the world. He has a foothold in creation, and we need to play our part in the coming invasion. So Abraham Kuyper, who was a 19th century theologian, who's an amazing man because he founded Uh, the Free University of Amsterdam, and later he founded the Dutch uh, Christian Democratic Party and actually became the prime minister of that country. And it was all based on this vision. He says this, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign of all, does not cry mine. Do we believe that? He did. So we have, as the new humanity, part of the new creation, a part to play. We need to redirect every sphere of creation back to its original intent. What that means is whatever our vocation, whatever our job, whatever our career, we have a redemptive task. And that task is to free creation from the shackles of sin and evil, to promote the common good, and enable human beings to thrive and flourish. That is why we are here. Does that make sense? That, you see, is the whole story. And we need to know the whole story, not just the half story. It's a story of creation, decreation, and recreation. That's what matters to me. So you need to know the whole story, not just the half story. Secondly, you need to be a culture shaper, not a culture survivor. What does that mean for the church's relationship to culture? Traditionally, the church has had a pretty ambiguous relationship with culture, hasn't it? And sometimes it can feel like the culture that we live in is something for us to survive rather than something for us to shape. And you can see that over the 20th century, if you, if you plot the church's response to culture, you get these, you get, the first you get condemnation, we condemn culture. Culture, the church argued, was decadent. God was not involved in culture at all, so what we need to do is withdraw from culture. That usually meant we didn't engage in certain activities like the cinema, or dancing, We didn't drink alcohol, those sorts of things that we picked out and said, they're bad, Uh, we mustn't be involved in that. Uh, We then moved from that position and began to critique culture. Yeah, you said, well, that argument was, well, you can't avoid it, uh, so instead try and engage with it, explore it, and critique it. And so look at the underlying themes and values and theology of pop culture. Uh, So, for example, you might like to think about um, why uh, the movies that we watch at the moment have so much public destruction in them. Why is it we love watching the White House destroyed or the city of New York blown to pieces? Whether we are watching The Avengers or Transformers, the movie, whatever it might be, that's what we view. I had a friend of mine who was always interested in asking that question. I went to see a movie with him, Zero Dark Thirty, And uh, we both came out, and he was like, amazing, that's the first movie I've seen for years where there's an unequivocal good guy and a bad guy, and we're with the good guys, and we just wanted to go out and kill all the terrorists. That was an interesting reflection, I thought, at the time. There was a deep sense of right and wrong. He could pick out the different themes that, and, and think those things through. So it's quite an intellectual movement, and, and actually, for most of us, it's too demanding. It's too difficult. And so what do we do instead? Well, we begin to copy culture, don't we? Aren't Christians good at copying culture? We can't critique it. That's a bit too complex. So we imitate it instead. And what do we end up with? Bad Christian music. We do, don't we? 
We just don't do it as well. We try and do the same things, but we're just slightly embarrassed by our attempts, and we end up doing it badly. And so really, we're slowly but surely, we're beginning to let go of the copying of culture. But sadly, all that means is we end up consuming the culture that we find ourselves in. It's capitulation to the culture around us. We've got nowhere to go. We no longer think about it. We no longer just copy it. We just consume it like everybody else, and we think, do I like that or don't I like that? And that's where we increasingly are at as a church. Now, do you notice with all of those approaches, they are all reactionary. Culture in all of those is made by someone else, isn't it? It's assuming that we have just let go of our responsibility as human beings to make culture, and we are letting other people do it, and then we respond or react to it. Now, if the whole story that I've just been telling is right, that's not enough, is it? It's not enough. We can't just react. We must ourselves produce culture. We must ourselves be culture makers creators of culture. So how can we be that sort of culture shaper? In your particular context, in your environment, wherever you find yourself, how can you be a culture shaper? And I'd love you just to think about four questions that, you might, uh, that might help you as you're thinking about making culture. The first is to ask, what's wrong? Because there will, there will be something in our culture that you need to confront because culture is a contested space. It's not a neutral space. So where is there corruption and inequality and injustice? Where can you promote civility and justice and the common good? What is wrong? Second question, what's missing? What do you need to create? Isn't that exciting? It might be a dripless baby cup. It might be, we, Dan and I were talking about the other day, an instant kettle that boils water instantaneously, although somebody's just made that, so you need to try something else. Is there an opportunity in your environment for innovation, creativity, and enterprise? And are you the entrepreneur? What's wrong? What is missing? Thirdly, what's good? It might be that you're, you don't think, wow, I'm not the entrepreneurial type. I'm not an innovator. Well, what can you celebrate and cultivate in your sphere of work, in your life? Yeah, what can you support? What can you say, well, actually, I know I'm a Christian, but do you know what? That doesn't just mean I'm against things. It means I'm for things too, and this is what I'm for. This is what is good. And then the fourth question is, what is confusing? How can you clarify and compel others with your vision for society and civilization, for your vision for human flourishing and the common good? You see, our culture is slowly decaying. Where can you play your part in its reformation? Four questions that I hope will help you just begin to think about being a culture shaper, not just a culture survivor. Because your call as a follower of Jesus, is to redirect the sphere of culture you work in so that human hearts can thrive to the glory of God. That's what it's about. And that's what matters to me. So don't just be a culture shaper. Sorry, a culture survivor. Be a culture shaper. Thirdly, give your whole life not just your spiritual life. What this means is that you, whatever you do, have a vocation, a calling. And you know, vocations aren't just for vicars. Hi, Orla. You all right, love? Do you want to cuddle? Yeah. Oh, hello. Mwah. You're a cuteness. I'm just um, giving a talk. Is that okay? Yeah. Oop, there we go. And it took me a long time to realize that it's not just vicars who have vocations. Joanne, I always tried for, for years in our marriage to get her to co-lead with me, to do things with me, whether that was leading a small group or leading a church, whatever it was, and it just never worked. And it was because she had her own call, 
her own sense of vocation, which was social justice, which was international development. And I realized quite late on, really, that my job as a vicar was to equip, enable, and empower her to do her job as a head of public policy. I needed to help her flourish in her calling. And for those of you who've never heard that from a vicar before, I'm sorry, because we do get it wrong really easily. You see, and what we mean by that is not tent making. So I don't want you to see your job as just something you do on the side, an excuse or an opportunity for kingdom work like evangelism. Your job doesn't just pay the bills. It's not a sideline because culture making that we're all involved in is our calling. So uh, on Friday night, uh, I was uh, in Farringdon with a friend of mine called Chad. He is, uh, he's just taken a huge risk. He's an entrepreneur, and he has just set up his own business, and he's trying to develop uh, a travel app. And uh, it's hugely demanding. He's, tr- he's fundraising at the moment. He's doing all sorts of different things, speaking to all sorts of different people. Um, and it's, it's, it's a travel log, essentially. But somewhere hidden within that... A bigger picture, that culture making that he's involved in, is this hope that what he is doing is introducing people to God's good world. And I said to him, you know, you don't need to think of it as, uh, well, I'm doing this and then I get to evangelize my friends. That's the spiritual bit. That's the Christian bit. In developing the app, that's spiritual. That's culture making. That's his vocation. And so I invested in the project. And what that means is that you have a mission. And you know, do you know what your mission is? I'm just going to release you from this for a moment. Your mission is not to spend your leisure time working on the vicar's mission projects. Okay? Just so you know that. It's great if you do. But that's not what your primary mission is. And for me as a vicar, it is tempting to suck you out of your cultural context and give you a job in the church. But that's a bit like a rabbi trying to recruit Esther or Daniel or Nehemiah for the coffee rota and and filling up their schedule so they've got no time to influence the destiny of nations. It extracts the possibilities for renewal out of the culture and clogs up the church with programs. It means you guys get too busy at church and we become a ghetto, a hermetically sealed subculture that's just written off and forgotten by the culture around us. And what we forget is the church is gathered like this, that really matters, and where else do you ever meet such a diverse group of people engaged in culture in so many different spheres? But it's both gathered and scattered. It's both an organization like this one and it's an organic movement of Christians throughout the culture. It is attractional as we draw people into this space to meet with the Lord and it is missional as we are sent out to be salt and light in our communities, in our workplaces, in the environments to which we are making culture. So my job is to inspire you with a vision, not just for the church, but for the city. It's a vision for the renewal of our culture. It's the promotion of shalom, of harmony, of the kingdom, the reign and rule of King Jesus on earth as in heaven. And I need to give you space and the resources you need to pursue that vision. And to do that, I really need you to help me, to help you. So you need to tell me what you need, because I'm just a vicar, so I have no idea. So my job as your leader is to equip you for the work of ministry. Does that make sense? And the work of ministry means shaping culture as God reconciles all things to himself in Christ to equip you as followers of Jesus in your cultural context, in the environment that you're in throughout the week, not just on the Sunday. And I'd love to give you a couple of examples that have inspired me to think about things in this way. Most recently, actually, Rachel Gardner was telling me about uh, a church I've mentioned to you before, Causeway Coast Vineyard. Uh, They are based in uh, the city of Coleraine in Northern Ireland, I think that is. And... uh, 
It's a, it's a town or a city where there's a family business that uh, employs most of the people in that city. Um, and uh, it had run into trouble. And it was laying people off. And they, it looked like there was going to be mass unemployment in that town. And one of the family was the operations manager in the church. So he was an employed member of staff organizing the church. And he asked the pastor if he could just take a bit of unpaid leave to try and help with the family business. And do you know what the church decided to do? They decided to pay him nine months' salary to go and sort out the business. Because they recognized that the church could not possibly thrive if the city itself was not thriving. That's a vision of culture making. That's a vision of the renewal of the cosmos. It's a vision for whole life discipleship. Another inspiration for me, I've mentioned this church to you before as well, is Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City. And they're, they're right at the heart of the city. And they say, you know, you really can't uh, minister to people in the city unless you talk about their vocations. And out of that church has come a ministry called the Center for City Renewal. And it has a fantastic vision statement. Let me read it to you. It says, The Center for City Renewal exists to work for the common good and flourishing of the city through the lens of civility, through theological formation, generative relationships, creative entrepreneurship, faithful cultivation, peaceable civility, pursuing justice, and stewarding privilege, participants will embody a gospel ethic in their work, culture, and urban living. I kind of feel like the church should be offering that stuff, really. But, you know, that's what we need to be doing. Offering, a, embodying a gospel ethic in their work, culture, and urban living. And perhaps for me, uh, the, uh, the example that's resonated with, with me most uh, was, uh, is a church called King's Cross Church. And uh, we visited their workspace. They have a, a workspace called uh, Tent which is a, a, a creative space, a work environment, a, an incubator, if you like, for innovators and entrepreneurs, micro-businesses and startups. They were given a, um, an empty floor of an office, really very generous, in the middle of King's Cross, and they weren't sure what to do with it. And, uh, and the pastor there was inspired um, to do something to create this space called Tent, which is a, it's, it's so well designed, it's super cool, there's loads of little creative bits everywhere. We just walked around it with our mouths open thinking, wow, I would love to work in this space. And he was inspired to create that um, through a trip to Uganda that he went on with Tear Fund. And it was exploring the church's support of micro-business in very poor communities in Uganda. And uh, they were doing a survey of everything, all the resources the villagers had, and they came to one man and he said, I've got nothing. There's no resource that I have that I can make culture with. And they said, okay, so what, what do you have? And he said, all I have is uh, this swamp that I live on. You know, that's all it is. It's absolutely without value. And the church and Tear Fund, with the support of Tear Fund, worked alongside this man, and they helped him to develop a plan. And he cleared the, uh, drained the swamp, created a fresh water pond or a lake, and began to breed fish. They introduced a couple of fish into the lake. That was hugely successful. It was actually brilliant conditions for the breeding of this particular type of fish. Uh, and eventually, through his lake, he was able to feed the whole village. More than that, through that lake, he could then sell some of the fish so the villagers had a little bit of income to improve their housing, their water supply, uh, uh, you know, their, their general environment. And, uh, and without the swamp, there were no mosquitoes. And so they suddenly found the, the health and the life expectancy of the village just went through the roof. And this pastor saw this happening, and for him it was a vision of salvation, because it was a vision of recreation. It was a vision of culture making, of what the church could be. Does that excite you? That excites me. So give your whole life, not just your spiritual life, 
That's what matters to me. So just to wrap things up before we have a, a short time of prayer. What matters to me? Joining God in the renewal of all things. That's what matters to me. So you've got to know the whole story, not just the half story. You've got to be a culture shaper, not just a culture survivor. And you've got to give your whole life, Monday morning, not just your spiritual life on a Sunday. So why don't we stand?